George Washington gave the first State of the Union address on January 8, 1790. It was an extraordinary time because Washington had only been president since April of 1789, so less than a year. And his first part of his term in office was probably one of the most successful of any head of state of any country of all time. I mean, it's a moment when he's alone, his cabinet has not arrived yet, and he's working with Congress to put flesh onto the skeleton of the Constitution, uh, to pass policies that are going to make this government a reality and get it into place and make sure that people uh, are obedient to this government. That's one of the great questions. There's been so much uh, resistance to it uh, in the coming of its ratification. Nobody's sure if people will actually obey the government when it's in place. And they do obey and it uh, thrives. It does particularly well. Uh, so much so, so that by the time he's giving his State of the Union address, he's actually quite enthusiastic. Before the State of the Union address, Washington had just traveled into New England. He had seen the countryside. He believed very strongly that a representative government uh, required that the popular opinion of the people needed to be understood, and so he wanted to make himself available. And what he saw in New England uh, empowered him. He felt that they had recovered from the ravages of war, that their ports were swelling with commerce and goods, and all of this uh, positive attitude he brought into his State of the Union address. So the Constitution doesn't say anything about when or where or even how often uh, the president is required to uh, uh, inform Congress about the State of the Union. But, so Washington uh, really establishes a precedent of the president delivering an annual State of the Union address, really at the opening or near the opening of a session of Congress, uh, as a way to sort of set the stage and really become a, a, a moment for leadership, to lead uh, the creation of agendas. Now, like all State of the Union addresses, there wasn't a lot of things surprising that Washington was going to say. There were all things that people probably had been talking about that needed to get done. Uh, but his State of the Union address is a, is a crucial template that touches on interesting aspects of the federal government's role in trying to secure the happiness of the country, its security, and safety abroad. So Washington gives the State of the Union address in Federal Hall in New York City. Uh, he's dressed in his black... Uh, a suit from Hartford, Connecticut, it's of, of American manufacture. He's wearing his dress sword uh, with a white scabbard. Uh, on his right side in Federal Hall in the Senate chamber is the Senate, at the front of which is John Adams, his vice president, who's the president of the Senate, of course. On his left side is the House of Representatives, uh, and at the head of the House is the Speaker of the House. Also there is Alexander Hamilton, his Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Knox, the Secretary of War, uh, Edmund Randolph, who's the Attorney General. Thomas Jefferson is not there, who is the first Secretary of State. He actually hasn't been sworn in yet. He doesn't arrive in New York uh, until March of 1790. So Washington gives his State of the Union address, and he begins by uh, mentioning the importance of having a strong military and being sure that you're prepared for defense. As he notes, to be prepared for war is the surest, most effectual way uh, to attain peace. And that's sort of uh, a well-known aphorism of the time, uh, but no less true for being well-known. And it really establishes right out front that the country really needs to assure that it can remain independent uh, by mobilizing its resources to create a strong defense. He also emphasizes that the country has to be prepared to fight aggressors. And in particular, he's worried about uh, Native American tribes, in particular the Creek uh, tribe, uh, the other thing he announces as he begins his State of the Union address is a very exciting aspect of the State of the Union, which is that North Carolina has actually now become uh, a member of the Union. They've ratified the Constitution, and that leaves only little Rhode Island, as Washington calls it, uh, on the outs, and they will eventually come in as well. So after talking about military uh, affairs, Washington steps to foreign affairs, and he talks about the need to have a strong, uh, well-funded foreign policy. Uh, the United States needs to establish its credit overseas, not only its reputation as a state that's stable uh, and can function in the realm of European diplomacy, but a, a state that's going to need to draw upon the resources of Europe uh, as it's trying to fix its own finances uh, moving forward. He talks about the need for infrastructure, for more roads and post roads to make sure the country is connected well together and that the economy thrives. 
And interestingly, he calls for the creation of a copyright act to assure that inventors uh, get uh, credit for their inventions and help spur innovation, what we would call in encouraging a spirit of entrepreneurship. This is very much a part of Washington's belief that the future strength of America comes from a diverse economy uh, that is uh, active and growing and innovating. Uh, so not unlike what we would hear in a typical State of the Union address today. Now also he calls for a uniform bill of naturalization. Uh, immigrants are flowing into the country, there isn't a uniform law of how they become citizens, uh, and so this has to be figured out. It's a matter of law, it's a matter of social stability, uh, it's a matter of encouraging uh, immigration, which is something the young country really wants to do. And finally, Washington really ends on encouraging the House and Senate to consider education and to consider how important education is. And Washington doesn't have a specific policy to lay out, and he gives a number of them. Maybe it's a national university, maybe it's some other seminaries of learning that can be uh, funded, but he clearly states that public happiness and the surest road to public happiness is through the patronage of education. He notes that in a representative government, uh, when the citizens are responsible for creating the policies, if the citizens aren't educated, the policies will be poor. Uh, so it's kind of a classic uh, emphasis in the State of Union Address. So if any president is ever looking for what they should do in their State of Union Address, Washington lays out a nice little template there for military, foreign affairs, economics, internal improvements, infrastructure, encouragement of entrepreneurship, and support for education. I don't know anybody who wouldn't think that that was a great policy.